Hey everybody, welcome to this week's roundup. Before we start, I just wanna say thank you to everybody who joined any of those VHS capture streams. I right now have listed almost all of the extra equipment up on eBay if anybody's interested in it. And I will have one post coming soon and a bunch of others to follow just to kind of discuss what I've learned and all of the testing that I've done. So uh, thank you for anybody who joined. That absolutely will eventually be a posts and a video or something. But if you're looking for awesome capture equipment, please check the link for the eBay stuff. But anyway, let's jump in and see what we got this week. First up, pre-orders are now open for a vinyl version of the Contra Shattered Soldier soundtrack. This was taken from the PS2 version, and it is available from a bunch of different sellers, US, UK, EU, all for about 40 bucks, and it's due to ship at the end of this year, so you should receive it before year's end. It comes on a 2LP yellow and orange and red splatter vinyl, um, and there's also a couple other variants available. So if you're into soundtracks on vinyl and you like Contra Shattered Soldier, definitely check Check out Crystal's post for the details and see if you want to pre-order one. Next up, Lewis from Zez Retro just did a podcast with Dan, the creator of The Light Menu, which never got released for the SIO. And this is a podcast that I think you all should probably listen to because it paints a very clear picture of what goes on a lot behind the scenes. And I've dealt very often with some of the same stuff that Dan's dealing with. And depending on who the people are, I've chosen different ways of handling it. And it's very interesting to see because uh, I've gotten legal threats all the time for things that just, that are absolutely not anything that would ever work. Like you can't sue somebody for saying, I like the color blue better than the color red. But I've had people come after me before and I normally just ignore it. Sometimes I respond with something not so polite and then ignore everything else. Uh, but depending on the people who come after you, the legal option might be their first threat, but then they might result to things like everything that Dan talked about. And then you kind of have to make a choice. You know, do I do the right thing and have to deal with all of this crap? Which, you know, let's be blunt. People with jobs and families and friends and hobbies and real lives don't have time for that. They'd rather just walk away and say, you know what, this isn't worth it. Even though walking away says that the person who's bullying you wins and that kind of allows them to continue doing it because they've never had real consequences for doing it. So it's weird. I, I don't know if there's ever a real right answer to this. And then there's all also the other side is what if everybody in the community jumps up and takes Dan's side and, and you know the right thing happens? Well, every time that happens, usually there's a residual group that loved the thrill of the hunt and want to keep going after people. And very often it lands on people who don't deserve it next. They're just, and it becomes a personal thing and not, and not doing the right thing. So I don't know if there's ever a right answer for stuff like this. I just know that this is one of the first times that I've heard exactly what's happened to me and quite a few other people actually out in the open for people to listen to. And most of the time I just don't back down because that's what I have to do to continue to get the truth out about things like, I don't know, lag test results and, you know, which things perform better than others. These aren't deep-seated political topics. These are ones and zero nerd things, but I still have people coming after me for this, especially behind the scenes and in the shadows type of shit. So, you know, it's weird. I don't know if there's any right answer, but at the very least, it would be nice if everybody heard what happened. Uh, you could draw your own conclusions, you could come up with your own opinions, but it's certainly something that, um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm glad the info's out there, I'm sorry this happened to Dan, and I, I really hope that, uh, I mean, that anytime, I really hope this stops, I really hope we all figure out a way to to stop the ability to bully people like this, so let me know what you all think, I'd love to hear if there is a, uh, you know, I, I'd love to hear opinions or possible solutions and you know, I'd also really like to see the light menu released so people who own a SIO could actually, you know, get some new updates for it. Next up, Greg from LaserBear has been selling SNES and Genesis to USB controller adapters. Now, Greg's been selling these for a while. Uh, my apologies, I was supposed to write a post on this months ago, but Greg was going to send me prototypes and I forgot to follow up and then, yeah, totally my bad. So if you've already bought one of Greg's LaserBit adapters, this is exactly that. It's the same thing that Greg's been selling since he released them and they are awesome. They are my go-to adapters. 
These are based on McGyver's one millisecond conversion boards. So if you're using one player, then it's a one millisecond of lag. And if you have two controllers plugged in, <coughs> it's two milliseconds of lag. So still basically zero. And um, I know a lot of people seem to get mad at me when I say that. I think they're misunderstanding. Two milliseconds of latency in a controller adapter in your brain, you should just count that as zero. It's as if it's not there. I think a lot of people mistake frames and milliseconds, and maybe sometimes I screw up and say frames by accident. Two frames of lag, you're right, is definitely not something that a lot of pro gamers would ever be able to deal with, but two milliseconds is basically zero. And in fact, the only time that you would need anything faster is for light guns. So these are what I've been using exclusively to play games on for the SNES and Genesis cores. And in fact, I used the Genesis one on the Master System core and a couple others. And same with the SNES, I used that on the NES core. But other than light guns, these are the go-to for me. You would only need the snack adapters if you want to use original light guns. Um, but as far as just gaming, there's no need for anything other than these one millisecond adapters. The price is uh, $40 for the SNES version, completely assembled, and $35 for the Genesis version. Uh, however, if you want to save some money, there are some kits available so you can get the parts, but just solder them all together yourself. So, you know, you save yourself some cash that way, or maybe you just want a fun little do-it-yourself project to work on. But either way, these are my absolute go-to for, for gaming on the Mister. And they're also compatible with Raspberry Pi, Windows, Linux, everything else. So yeah, can't really, can't really say enough about these. Um, <clears throat> the only other thing to mention is they are available elsewhere. Uh, but, uh, I just would double check that whoever you're buying them from are following the open source terms like Greg is. And if you're in Europe, maybe just pick them up directly from Mick on the Damon Byte store. But if you're in the US, this is kind of a no brainer. So definitely check out the links. Next up, Nicole just wrote up a really awesome post about the NES Zapper and how it's able to work on flat panels, mostly with some software patches, and also how it differs from things like the SMS light phaser, which is potentially more accurate. Uh, I'm obviously a huge fan of some light gun games. Some are okay, but some are really fun. And I think they're just experiences that you could have with friends that don't take up too much time. I just love how like, you know, I, I do like sinking into a good gaming session, but if you have a couple of friends over, it's not, no one's ever too old to grab a zapper and shoot some duck hunt. And you don't have to play for hours. You could play for two minutes or you could play for 20 minutes. So I always take the good light gun games probably more serious than other people do. And it's really cool just to have an inside look of how it works and some of the research that, that Nicole had done into it. So if you're even slightly interested in light gun style nerdy conversations, absolutely read through this and uh, you'll probably enjoy just the different uh, um, the different perspective on it, especially on the LCD mod, which I covered quite a while back, but not in the technical detail that Nicole does. So I'd also love to see a follow-up with the SMS light phaser. So uh, anybody have a spare light phaser they want to donate over to Nicole so we can get another write-up on that one? Let me know. I'll put you in touch. But yeah, this was a, a, a definite fun one, and uh, hopefully you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Next up, Greg from LaserBear just opened pre-orders on the next revision of the Sega Nomad battery pack. And there's a couple of things that you're definitely gonna wanna note about this. First of all, respectfully, if you bought the first version, there's really not any reason to upgrade. You didn't lose anything in buying the first one. The first one's still amazing. I always like to make that clear because I know it's very easy to, when a new thing comes out, to kind of go, aw, about your older revision. But this is a couple of tweaks and one addition to it. So if you're kind of thinking about buying one of these, now's the time. But if you already own one, you know, don't worry, your product's already awesome. But essentially, this is a completely plug and play device, zero mod required will work with stock and modified nomads that just plugs into the back. You need to purchase two batteries separate and you could have about six hours battery life, give or take, depending on the mods that you're doing or if you're using an EverDrive and you're using Sega CD or, you know, basically you know, everything factors into this, but about six hours battery life with the best batteries that you could buy. This one offers USB-C charging as well as standard AC charging. You could only use one at a time. You don't get any benefit from plugging them both in. There's protection, so if somebody does accidentally 
plug both in. I don't know how or why you would do that, but it's not going to blow it up or anything like that. And another very big advantage, uh, same as the original battery pack, is that you could play and charge at the same time. So if you had one of the uh, Nomad packs with six AA batteries in it, if your batteries were running low and you plugged the AC or the AC adapter into the top of your Nomad, it would reset the Nomad, which is kind of annoying if you're in the middle of a game and just wanted to keep playing. But with Greg's battery pack, both the old one and the new one, if you're in the middle of a gaming session and you plug your charger in, it'll start charging the batteries, but it will not affect your gameplay. You're still, it won't reset the Nomad, yeah, obviously it'll take longer to charge if you're playing and charging at the same time, but that will work as well. So I thought all of those things were very awesome. And that's why I loved the, one of the many reasons why I loved the original, but this one adding the potential for USB-C charging is pretty cool too. Cause I imagine there's people out there that have a good tablet USB charger, but don't have an original Genesis charger. So if you have one of those junky ones that weigh about an ounce and you'd cost a dollar on uh, Amazon or AliExpress that you might want to just use a really good quality tablet charger or something instead to, to charge your battery pack. So that's pretty cool. Another addition is uh, the battery door slides up instead of down. Um, I thought that was pretty neat. I'm not really sure why it would be a problem going the opposite direction, but that's cool. That's uh, maybe it's because it would pop the, the Nomad pack off. I don't know. I never had a problem with it, to be honest with you. The only other thing to note about this is there are a couple of different choices of battery, and it's a specific type of battery. It's not like rechargeable double A's. And the Nightcore ones are the best. They will last the longest, but they're probably out of stock. An excellent second choice is from the 18650 battery store, um, the Epoch ones that uh, I also linked to, and that should be just as long of a battery life and uh, perform just as well. However, I also found a, a much cheaper one on Amazon that is completely safe to work. It is cheaper and you just don't get the same battery life. I think I got about three hours of battery life on it. So everything is linked there as well as the original review that shows it side by side with the original Nomad battery pack. The dimensions and everything are basically the same as before. So if you want any more info on it, the price is 50 and it's due to ship in early December. And once again, that's $50 completed without the batteries. So fully assembled and ready to go, but you have to buy the batteries separate. And I believe you could buy them in kits as well if you want to assemble them yourself, but I'm too lazy to do that. I like to just have it arrive assembled and everything. So if you have a Nomad, seriously consider this one because it's definitely an upgrade and it's uh, way easier than trying to deal with the original one and like six Eneloop batteries or something. Next up, Sega Saturn homebrew developer Jay Beretta just released a demo of a new survival horror game for the Saturn 29th anniversary game competition. And this seems pretty cool. It's kind of like Silent Hill style. And the demo is not complete. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a demo, so it's not a full game or anything. But it looks like it has a ton of potential. And it's, it's pretty neat. It's in the same vein of all those survival horror games. But um, a new spin on it. And it kind of... A, it just looks interesting. I don't know. I'm trying to find the right words. The Shiro crew did, as always, an awesome write-up for this. So if you want to see screenshots and a description of what to expect through it, I strongly recommend scrolling through. If you want to be completely surprised, don't, because there's just pictures of the game in here. But um, I would. I would scroll through and, and read it and then go to the Sega Extreme website if you want to download it yourself and check it out. But I always love seeing new games on older hardware, especially when it's not the same thing over and over. Sometimes that's cool, but you know, very often there's ROM hacks that just uh, kind of get beaten to death, and some of them are great, but having a new original game is always something that's a lot of fun, even just a demo. So uh, if you're even remotely interested in survival horror games or the Sega Saturn, definitely check out the Shiro post. Next up, Dan Mons posted an absolutely awesome write-up about the color differences between D65 and D93. If you've ever had a PVM or a BVM, you've probably flipped through the settings and seen that, and maybe even toggled it to see what happened, but there's never really been an easy, or at least in the retro gaming world, an easy discussion to follow about what the differences between the color are. And also, why does it matter? And Dan really did a great job summarizing it, including some work by Keith Rainey as well. 
I'll flip through it kind of quickly, but honestly, if you're even remotely interested in this stuff, please read Dan's post because this just really clarified a lot of things. And even just hearing it described by a retro gamer for a retro gamer made these things a little easier to wrap my head around. But basically, there's different types of color space that could be used when watching any of these co content or developing it. So when developers were making these games, were they using... Japanese CRTs with D93, as was usually the standard there? Or were they thinking about the D65 color, which is what most other people would probably have seen? And while Dan gets into the details, I'm just going to kind of skip right to the examples and, uh, and hope that you'll go back. But there's quite a bit of difference if you have a decent monitor as to what the colors actually look like. And there's certainly some hints that think or, or that allude to the fact that maybe some games were developed in D93, which is why they might not quite look right, no matter what, on different CRTs. Dan did a really great job showing differences between orange, yellow, green, and blue for Zelda and Super Metroid. Um, and it really highlights how drastic the changes are. And one thing that Dan posted that was kind of interesting is the Wii's Twilight Princess was kind of a warm game. And when used in D93, it sort of looks correct. So it almost leads you to believe that the displays that were used were already calibrated to D93. So we might technically have all been looking at that game wrong. So it's a really awesome post. I strongly recommend just reading every word of it to just take all of this in. But at the very least, check out the color differences, both in the squares, but also in the screenshots. So you can see as it scrolls through how very different, subtle, but different games like Zelda and Super Metroid look with the different color spectrums. So this is definitely going to have me rethink which color I use when playing on BVMs now and, and try to get it, I don't know, I don't want to say get it right, because I guess how you played it growing up, if uh, you know, if you played these games as a kid, would have been the right way for you. But I don't know. I think I'd like to see it the way the developer saw it. So definitely check out the post and such great info in here. Now it's time for this week's Mr. Updates, Care of Lou from Lou's Retro Source. As usual, I'm just going to skim through these different topics, but if you want to hear any more info on it or see some visual examples, please check out Lou's video. First up, if you're using a controller adapter based on Sonic BR's Retrozord design, a new firmware will soon be released that adds things like user-selectable output modes between X input, switch, PS3, D input. It adds rumble with X input, analog triggers on X input and PS3, and NegCon and JogCon will work on all output modes, but the spinner is always on D input. So kind of important updates if you're using anything based on that design. Next up, Attract17 posted an image of Total Carnage's test menu running on the Mister. Total Carnage is a twin-stick shooter arcade game from the 90s, which would be a kind of a fun addition. I also just modded one of my arcade sticks to also have a spinner. So I wonder in the twin-stick configuration, could I use the spinner, maybe? I don't know, I'll have to mess with that and see. Next up, Retrofrog has released the 3D files to his small console-style Mr. FPGA case, and this specific one doesn't use the standard USB hub plate, but uses a cheap four-port USB hub. I've seen pictures of this thing. It looks really cool. If you're a 3D printer, definitely check out the links and see, uh, but I'm always appreciative of newer Mr. cases, especially ones that add something. Does it look like a console? Does it route the ports to the back? Is it just super small and compact, like my favorite, the Retro Castle case? So uh, thanks, Todd, for doing these. I really like seeing stuff like this. Next up, Hans Beyer updated us that Mystex with the Pi Zero is now working, and Antonio Villena has made a Pi Zero adapter board that could possibly give the Artix 100T Mystex compatibility. So there's still DDR memory issues that need to be solved, and currently you can't run any Mr. Core on it, but it is very, very neat to see some of the whole Mystex architecture being ported and could possibly start to see stuff running on different platforms. Uh, there's the laser bit controller adapters that I already talked about. Um, Hotego still is working on the Splatterhouse core, and what's holding it back is the MCU chip that needs some new instructions. But thanks to the outgoing, thanks to the ongoing MCU work, the Bubble Bobble core has been improved, and future work on improving Double Dragon will also be made using that. And 
the N64, <coughs> the N64 core can now run Pokemon Game Boy games with the transfer pack in Pokemon Stadium. You can either use real N64 peripherals through Snack or just use the emulated tran <coughs> excuse me, just use the emulated transfer pa pack within the core. So that's pretty incredible. That really just goes to show the accuracy of it. If you could even do Game Boy transfer pack games through the Snack adapter. So that's pretty awesome. There's also a ton of gra graphic bugs fixed in the RDP and a bunch of other little things that Robert's just continuing to perfect on that core. So thank you so much to Robert for continuing all of his wizardry. So that's it for this week, but please don't forget to subscribe to Lou on YouTube. And thanks again to Lou for always keeping up with this stuff because there's no way I'd be able to keep up with it. Next, that new OSSC revision I talked about before is now in stock and ready to purchase. Before I go into the details, I just want to say who this is for. This is for somebody whose OSSC is broke. Maybe you plugged the wrong power supply into it or something and you need to replace it. Or it's for somebody that never purchased one but was thinking, you know what, I really do need one of these. So definitely look at this newer version because it comes from the factory being able to run the latest firmware, which allows for Shadow Mask CRT emulation, HDR mode, 1440p pixel repetition mode, and improved sync support on the input side. So basically, if you had arcade boards or retro computers that weren't working with the OSSC before, they might work after this update. Now, you could still do that update once again to any of the previous OSSCs. You're just going to have to do a couple of mods that are way trickier than they look. So you have to remove a very small surface mount resistor, which that's not the hard part. And then you need to solder a small wire to the top pad. It's R35, I have everything marked off in pictures here. And then you have to very carefully run that wire around everything and solder it to the end pin on one of the main chips. So the mod itself isn't hard at all, removing a resistor, linking two points together. It's just that you're soldering to tiny pads and it's very easy to mess that up like I did. Luckily I have friends that are able to help out when I screw up all these things. So if you're a beginner, I definitely would not try this, but if you're intermediate modder, yeah, give it a try. Just be very patient and uh, maybe even uh, do the, the chip side first, tack down the wire with uh, tape or glue. And once again, glue the wire to the board. Don't glue the solder joint. People love to hate on glue, but when it's used in the correct method, it's totally fine. And even if it falls off later on, it's non-conductive, you're totally fine, and it'll get the mod through. But tack that one side down, run the wire, uh, obviously pre-lengthen the wire before you do all this so you don't have to mess with it, then remove the resistor and pad and put it in its place and tack that down as well. I might even tack it down before I uh, touched the solder joint to it to make sure that it sticks, just so there's no pressure on the pin or the pad. Everything's already tacked down, but it is doable. It's just not as easy as it looks, especially when I have pictures zoomed in really close to make it look like it's easier. But overall, I think this is awesome. Um, also, you don't have to update the firmware. The OSSC was absolutely awesome before this firmware update. I would only update if you needed to fix the sync issues, if you had a 1440p monitor that running it in its native resolution and in pixel repetition mode would actually benefit from that. Um, or of course, if you just wanted to check out the CRT scan lines, which I think are actually great. <coughs> I have it, excuse me, I have it set side by side with the Tink 5X and it's very different. But if you, you, if you look at from a look at it from a normal viewing distance, not a zoomed in a thousand percent like I usually show, it actually pulls off the effect of a CRT very nicely. And one of the things I've learned is sometimes when you zoom in, making the picture look exactly like a CRT isn't actually the desired effect once you zoom out and start to work at a normal or play it at a normal viewing distance. So if you have the ability to do the update and you want to try this out, it's absolutely worth your time because it's a free update. And uh, I think that's why I'll end this one. Just thanking Marcus once again for always putting out new updates for these things, even long past the, the any of the ex any expected updates. So really appreciate free updates and continued support on an awesome product. And once again, just because new stuff's coming out does not make old stuff obsolete. The OSSC is still equally as amazing as it was a year ago. It just sits alongside other options. But at this price point, 
I see a lot of people still going this, uh, going to this over other options just because of how cheap it is comparatively speaking. So the OSSE isn't going anywhere. Just make sure to buy it from a reputable seller and not one of the clone companies that makes low quality slapped together versions that probably stop working after three to six months. Heard a lot of people complain about that. So link is in the description to the proper purchasing of the OSSC as well as the firmware update. Uh, and if you need to have the mod service done in uh, you're in Europe, you might want to go right through video game perfection. And if not, just contact your local modder and see if they'll be able to do it for you. Wobbling Pixels just posted an awesome tutorial for calibrating the ADC settings in your RetroTank 5X. Now, I have to start by saying you do not need to do this. I always like to drive the point home in every kind of RetroTank related conversation that the only thing that you need to do is power it on, select your input, and that's it. That's the only thing that you ever need to do with a Tink product. However, there's a lot more you can do. And one of the things I always talk about is no two consoles are the same. And this comes down to a lot of factors, but also a lot of the components that were used were five or 10% tolerant components. So that means if you have a 100 ohm resistor, it might actually be 95 ohms or 105 ohms. And you do that throughout an entire manufacturing process you could have two of the exact same motherboard revisions that are you know, a couple of serial numbers apart that actually output much different RGB levels from each other once you really dig into it. So what Wobble and Pixels did is show you how to use test patterns to calibrate the ADC, the analog to digital conversion settings, in order to make it output the correct brightness level. So this is something that you only have to do once per console, but it is to your console. So don't copy any of the things that the only of the numbers that Wobbling Pixel showed, just copy the procedure and follow it on your own. And the only other last tip I'll add is when an image is slightly too dim. So it's, instead of the exact 714 millivolts that is expecting, uh, or that most devices are expecting in the analog video world, if it's at 700, 685, you're fine. All you might need to do is turn up your TV's brightness or just if you're in a dim room, it probably looked totally fine anyway. However, the moment you start going over 714 millivolts, the image starts to wash out and you actually lose information. So turning the brightness down on your TV is not going to fix anything. So while this is much more relevant on the console end of things, I word vomiting all of this just to tell you if you're messing around with your ADC settings, and you're kind of, kind of going back and forth between one or the other, always default to the slightly dimmer instead of the slightly brighter, just to make sure you're not losing any data. And unless you're actually putting the stuff on a scope and testing as you, as you use it or anything like that. But if you did that, you probably wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be using the ADC on the tank to tweak anything. So just wanted to add that, you know, a tiny bit too dark, always okay. A tiny bit too bright is still fine. It's not a safety issue, but it's not as good. And of course, in a perfect world, it would be nailed directly in the middle, but not all of us have eyes like FBX and tech. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna look at a screen and eyeball it, a little too dim is probably a better way to go. Well, that's it for this time. As always, thanks to everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments, and especially thank you to everybody who supports in any way possible, because you are the only reason all of this stuff is continuing to move along and all the behind the scenes stuff keeps happening, and of course, the weekly stuff. So honestly, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you, and I'll see you next week.